so very good evening to all respected doctors our distinguished speaker and dear colleague i himanshu rathore on the behalf of mankind pharma limited take this opportunity in extending a very warm welcome for ent upper crest advanced certification program and i would like to sincerely thank each one of you for your gracious presence and making this event possible today our entire session today is divided into three different segment we will start with the first session which is brief introduction about mankind pharma later on uh, dr surikant repati sir will have the session and then in the end we will have question answer session so let us start with the corporate presentation so mankind pharma in 2022 has completed 27 years journey in indian healthcare lands indian healthcare landscape we started our operation in 1995 with the philosophy of serving life and our first generation entrepreneur shri rc juneja sir with a vision to create most admirable indian pharmaceutical company with its focus on providing quality healthcare products services at most affordable cost with the extensive avail availability to our patients keeping that vision in mind today mankind is the fastest growing and third largest indian pharmaceutical company we are sincerely thankful to each one of you as without your support we would have never been able to reach this pinnacle of success mankind pharma has achieved many milestone in this journey of last two and half decade whereas we started our operation in 1995 and by the year 2008 mankind pharma was the therapeutic leader in all the therapeutic segment in 2017 mankind pharma has basically launched the us operations and in 2019 mankind pharma got its first us fda approval for the manufacturing unit we are very pleased to announce that mankind pharma was the first indian company and second in the world to produce diadrogestron in the year of 2020 so these were the few milestone achieved by mankind pharma in last two and half decades mankind also has a very strong footprints in research and development we have almost 3 r&d centers and 600 scientists who are working uh, in into this r&d centers on a very different and innovative projects out of which rrp 119 is one of the project which is oral anti diabetic drug which is undergoing unto the trials with this we also have we also stood up uh, with the country uh, under the war, war against the covid 19 we provided financial support to support to more than 2000 families of frontline healthcare workers uh, during the covid 19 era also mankind pharma is the first company to launch an ott platform which is specifically designed for doctors whose name is docflix so docflix is a scientific uh, is a platform in which scientific content will be published in the form of videos on varied subject like documentary of leading doctors in india cross therapy discussion and much more doctors like jp soni jamshed dalal and anindal has contributed to the content of docflix so the docflix is now live and all the doctors can register this particular ott platform with this i hand over the session to dr prashant thank you himanshu and uh, thank you everyone who have joined us here in this scientific evening where this is the first module of this advanced certification program the ent upper crest as you are already aware this program is also endorsed by indian college of allergy asthma and applied immunology now it's time to introduce our speaker of this evening dr surekant sir himanshu ppt uh, pratik can we see a slide himanshu ha no next no not this slide pratik uh, the same himanshu your slide yeah please move forward yeah as you are already aware dr surekant tripathi needs no introduction he is professor and head department of respiratory medicine at king george medical university up lucknow he is also the national vice chairman of ima ams and has been past president for various international acclaimed societies such as indian chest society national college of chest physicians indian college of allergy asthma and applied immunology medical sciences section of indian science congress associations he is also the current vice president for ima up 
chairman of North Zone Task Force for TB Elimination. He has many publications to his name and many books where he has written chapters or complete books. So 19 books to his credit and 64 chapters to his credit and more than 400 publications to his name in various national and international journals. He has been awarded with nine, more than 19 fellowships and he has given 12 orations and has U two US patents also in his name. He is very keen on community participation via more than 20 NGOs and also a very good teacher and a voracious speaker. So I welcome Dr. Surekant Tripathi, sir, to initiate his session. Sir, over to you. Okay. Thank you, Prashant. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rathor, and thank you, Dr. Prashant. It's a wonderful opportunity that I'm today for a webinar, which is on the platform of Indian Journal of Clinical Practice, founded by the late Dr. K.K. Agarwal. He was like my elder brother. So in every webinar, I used to pay my tribute to late Dr. K.K. Agarwal. He has contributed to the medical fraternity as well as the society immensely. And the second platform, which you can see that the today's webinar is endorsed by Indian College of Allergy, Asthma and Applied Immunology. And I have been president of this society and closely related still with the all activities of Indian College of Allergy, Asthma and Applied Immunology. The third platform is of the sponsor, that is the mankind. And in, during the COVID times, I get associated with the mankind very closely, especially I would talk on the, uh, the, the, the name suggests mankind and kind of mankind gesture, which they have given during the last two and a half years. And at least in two programs, I was the witness. I was part of the program. And in one program, I was chief guest. Another program, I was guest of honor, where they gave the financial support to the families of is it the right term the doctors who devoted their life in the fight against COVID-19 and we used to call them COVID martyrs or COVID shaheed. So I have witnessed two such type of program and they have already introduced in the introduction they have given the financial support uh, to the 2000 families of the COVID frontline workers. So today we are talking of a link of the ENT specialist and the pulmonary specialist. As introduced by the organizers, I am the lung specialist or pulmonary specialist. But in, in one minute, I will clear what is the link between ENT and chest. You see, we used to have uh, a song in the Hindi films, Niche Paan Ki Dukan Upar Bhavi Ka Makan. Yes, so this is the two-storied house where the first floor is like ENT and ground floor is like the lungs. Yes, this is the best described in for the public domain by me, the linkage of ENT and chest physicians. The ENT domain basically work like a first floor and lung domain basically work like a ground floor. Suppose if your roof is leaking, so where is the problem? It is problem in the roof, not in the floor. Suppose your roof is leaking, roof of two-storied house is leaking. So problem is in the roof, what ultimately it will spoil the floor. So if there is a problem, recurrent problem, especially in the ENT part, this will lead to poor perspective in cases of lung condition. So that is the link between the ENT and lung, that if you are ignoring the ENT problem and treating and considering only the lung problem, you are a not good pulmonologist. So I used to say that every pulmonologist should refer the patient, at least difficult patient, to an ENT specialist just to correct the up roof of the house. Similarly, I used to say that ultimately ENT problem will lend up into some kind of lung problem. So every ENT specialist, especially the uh, patients of allergic rhinitis and sinusitis, they should also be referred to the lung specialist because one third of the 
allergic rhinitis patient, they are the potential future candidate of bronchial asthma. And 80% of asthma cases, they are associated with allergic rhinosinusitis. So with this background, now I'm coming to my topic that for today's webinar, that is ENT Upper Crest live webinar on 6 August uh, 2000, uh, 20, sorry, this is the mistake, 2022, 2022. And this webinar is endorsed by Indian College of Allergy, Asthma and Applied Immunology. So, you see, those who always remember their history, they are always progressive. We have to learn lesson, a lot of lessons from the history. So what is the historical aspect of allergy? That I will discuss first. So now see, this is the man of early uh, 20th century, Von Pirke. And he described the term allergy in 1906. He coined the word allergy from the Greek word allos, meaning the other, and ergon, meaning work, to describe the hypersensitivity reaction. And then we should remember our father of allergy in India. I don't know how many of ENT specialists you know that who is the father of allergy practice in India. He is the Dr. D. N. Shipuri. And I, myself, Dr. Surikant, is feeling proud today that he was our alumni, our alumni of Department of Respiratory Medicine, King George Medical University, UP Lucknow, to which I belong. I had in the department for last 11 years. So he is the man who passed his MBBS and MD from King George Medical College. At that time, the name was King George Medical College and then MD from our Department of Respiratory Medicine. And then he worked in the Patel Chess Institute, a pioneer institute of allergy in the country, established in 1952 inaugurated by Sardar Patel, the then Home Minister of India. And then, as I belong to, of course, the state of Uttar Pradesh, the largest state of the India, with a population of 25 crore people. So here in our state, Dr. M. S. Agnotri, my guru, he was my head of department during my MD days. And especially when I'm working as a senior resident, he was my head of department. So, Dr. M. S. Agnotri, Dr. Madhu Sudan Agnotri, he was professor and had uh, uh, three times had uh, during different uh, tenures, and he is also he was also alumni of King George Medical College and Department of Respiratory. He also did his uh, 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 specialty uh, of respiratory medicine from our department. So, with this, the international pioneer in the field of allergy, the Indian pioneer in the field of allergy and the pioneer of Uttar Pradesh in the field of energy, allergy. There are certain other things to remember as far as the historical perspective is concerned. Frederick in 1921 wrote various therapies in a textbook and he basically described that wearing eyeglasses is a very important preventive aspect for ocular allergy. Uh, what are the various things for the nasal protection? What are the various uh, role of topical adrenaline injection? Because it's still in anaphylaxis, we use this adrenaline injection. What is the, of course, potential role of uh, topical cocaine in severe cases of allergy? Climate change and allergic substance given regularly six feet before attack. So such kind of things in early 20th century he described regarding the allergy. Now, after this, a little bit introduction. You see, uh, we are practicing allergy. Most of the people of ENT, respiratory medicine, the med general medicine, skin means derma, ophthalmologists, they are all practicing allergy. But if somebody wants to describe allergy for the layman, for the public domain, then this is my concept slide I used to teach in my public lectures that this is the plant, this is called touch me not plant. If you touch any other leaves of any other plant, for example, you are touching the uh, leaves of mango tree, you are touching the leaves of any tree, any, any flower or any plant, small plant or larger plant, nothing will happen. You will touch, nothing will happen. But if you will touch the leaves of touch me not plant, then what will happen? They will shrink. And this is called hypersensitivity reaction of the touch me new plant. Similarly, there are these surfaces, for example, nasal mucosa, ocular mucosa, the skin, derma, 
and, and so many other mucosa of the body, they when are exposed to certain allergens, then there is a hypersensitivity reaction and that is termed as allergy. So it is basically the genetically determined the hypersensitivity state which leads to the manifestation of allergy with the exposure of certain factors which are called allergen. Now, what is the prevalence? What is the global scenario and what is the Indian scenario? If you see the global scenario, then roughly 10% to 30% or even some part of the country, some part of the world, the 63%, this is the range of people suffering from various allergic disorder. In our country also, the prevalence of various allergic disorder is 10 to 30%. Means even a, every third Indian patient can be can suffer from allergy at one or other point of time. Now, this is the, uh, you see, news of uh, the, uh, one of the newspaper that every third delight suffers from allergy. So, more air polluted city, more congested city, the more chances of allergy are. So, that is the uh, public domain news also that uh, allergy is much more prevalent in our country. Now, question is, what is allergy and what is allergen? So, allergy is an altered and accelerated reaction of a person to a second and subsequent exposure to a foreign substance, which is called allergen, for which the body has already been sensitized previously by allergen-specific immunoglobin E. The term allergy was coined in 1906 by Von Pirke. We have already mentioned. And the term allergen means... It's a, this term is used for antigen, which are basically proteins or glycoproteins and cause type 1 allergic reaction, which is called early phase reaction also. Now, uh, you are the ENT people, so you know better than me. This is the sagittal section and various sinuses, frontal sinus, ethmoid sinus, maxillary sinuses. These are the healthy sinuses. But if you see in chronic sinusitis, because allergic rhinitis is usually associated with sinusitis also, so we must have idea where, what are the sinuses, where are the sinuses are located and how they look like during the condition of allergic rhinosinusitis. So the mucosa get thickened, uh, a lot of fluid collection is there, mucus collection is there and this situation, if you compare to the normal healthy sinuses, this is called chronic sinusitis. Now there are terms, for example, rhinosinusitis means the inflammation of nose and paranasal sinuses. Acute rhinosinusitis means the symptoms of purulent nasal discharge, nasal obstruction, facial pain, and pressure or fullness or both for equal to or less than four weeks, almost less than one month duration. So if these symptoms are of less than one month duration, this is acute rhinosinusitis. Subacute rhinosinusitis means the similar symptoms lasting for four to eight weeks. And chronic rhinosinusitis means the symptoms for more than eight weeks. So four weeks, four to eight weeks, and more than eight weeks. Now, there are two kinds of definition. The rhinosinusitis in adults, this is the entire scenario, the different scenario, and rhinosinusitis in children. The rhinos, chronic rhinosinusitis in adults is basically the defined as the presence of two or more symptoms, one of which should be either negative blockage or obstruction or congestion or nasal discharge, anterior or posterior nasal drip, plus minus facial pain or pressure, plus minus reduction or loss of smell for more than eight weeks with validation by telephone or interview questions on allergic symptoms. Now, same definition of the chronic rhinosinusitis in children means the presence of two or more symptoms, one of which should be either nasal blockage or obstruction, congestion or nasal discharge, plus minus facial pain or pressure, cough for more than eight weeks with validation by telephone or interview. Now, what is the pathophilia? With this background, historical perspective, definitions, concept of the uh, allergy, then coming to the pathophysiology. And I don't think that we should devote much of the time because this is the inflammatory cascade involving a lot of inflammatory and cytokine cells and ultimately uh, you can see uh, the allergic reaction begins with the activation of mast cells and release of histamine. So this is the basic thing that is the 
early phase reaction where, where the mast cells are released by degranulation of histamine by degranulation of mast cells uh, the histamine is released so this is the cut section of the normal uh, the sinuses and nose and this is the allergic reaction where you find a lot of uh, mucus and inflammation then of course the mucus drainage pathways in sinuses is very important as your you see the uh, the uh, tubes or the the nalis of the bathroom they got they got choked similarly the sinuses drainage system is also very peculiar and ent people you know better than this uh, than, than me this is the see, the drainage system of the sinuses which get choked and ultimately lead into the chronic rhino sinusitis and then in first exposure as we know that in first exposure to the allergen there is a sensitization and in the second exposure there is a release of histamine and of course various allergic reactions so this is the again second exposure where the degranulation of uh, the mast cells and ultimately release of a lot of uh, allergic components and uh, now coming to the early, this is the early phase reaction or late phase reaction and what are the pathogens involved you see in children uh, pathogens are little bit different than adults in children the aerobic bacteria can be the alpha hemolytic streptococcus around 20% cases haemophilus influenza around 19% cases streptococcus pneumonia around 14% cases streptococcus epidermidis uh, around 13% cases staph aureus around 9% cases and anaerobes around 8% cases while in adults in contrast to the children the streptococcus species is most common that is 21% influenza is second and third is the staph aureus while cateralis is the 10% and anaerobes uh, are also the uh, various uh, species may be from 31% to 16% nosocomial uh, situ in the nosocomial situation usually there is a infection by gram negative uh, bacteria like pseudomonas aureus clasella enterobacteria species proteus serratia and gram positive cocci can be streptococci or staphylococci and then chronic rhinocytis with nasal polyp that's a special condition for you ent people where the nasal polyposis occurs in chronic rhinocytis the polymicrobial aerobic and anaerobic flora can be also present as a secondary infection in nasal polyp now classification for chronic rhinocytis various classification have been given but most important thing is that chronic rhino chronic rhinitis can be divided into three parts broadly the inflammatory non inflammatory and the structural rhinitis the inflammatory rhinitis can be allergic can be non allergic the allergic one is usually called seasonal perennial or occupational although the these names are also become very older now the intermittent or persistent non allergic one is called the depending upon the type of uh, inflammatory cells can be eosinophilic basophilic metachromatic infectious polyps uh, atrophic systemic or irritant and then non inflammatory Uh, chronic rhinitis can be the rhinitis medica mentosa reflex induced hormonal or it can be vaso motor structural rhinitis can be septal deviation usually dns which is called deviated nasal septum tumors and polyps and miscellaneous condition tumors of others now differential diagnosis between allergic and non allergic rhinitis why it is important because allergic rhinitis has the different kind of treatment and non allergic rhinitis has different kind of treatment so we must differentiate what is the uh, the differences between allergic and non allergic rhinitis now the age of the onset in allergic rhinitis usually before the age of 20 years while in non uh, allergic rhinitis usually is uh, 30 years or even more than if you see the relation with season usually with the seasonal variation present in allergic rhinitis while it is persistent uh, in case of non allergic rhinitis throughout the year exacerbating factors the allergy exposure in case of allergic rhinitis while irritant exposure of weather conditions are for the working as a exacerbated factor for the chronic non allergic rhinitis what are the nature of symptom if you see pruritus it is more common in allergic rhinitis rare in non allergic congestion is more common in allergic uh, it's also common in non allergic sneezing is prominent in case of allergic rhinitis usually not prominent and can be dominant in some cases of non allergic one the postural drainage is not prominent here in rhino allergic one while prominent in non allergic one 
the <clears throat> other related manifestation, for example, allergic conjunctivitis, allergic dermatitis, often present. So whenever you have a kind of allergic conjunctivitis, you should search for the other allergic condition also because they mostly they are present. Or you can find the history of allergy march. What is allergy march? At the certain age, early childhood, there is a different kind of allergy. After the uh, the infancy or early childhood, when you come to the late childhood, the different kind of allergy. And in the adolescent or adult, the different kind of allergy. For example, a child started with food allergy, then skin allergy, then asthma. So this is called allergy march. So and then family history usually present in present in allergic rhinitis and uh, usually absent in non-allergic rhinitis. Physical appearance, if you see the variable, the classically uh, described as a pale, a boggy, swollen, may appear normal, uh, while in case of erythematous, uh, maybe situation in non-allergic. And you see, if you are traveling in a mall or roaming around, and then from the distance, you can see that his nose is red, swollen, appears to be some inflammatory, fiery, then you can say, oh, probably this is the allergic rhinitis case. And ancillary studies uh, uh, can be done like allergic skin test. They are always positive in case of allergic, while even the serum IgA or isnophilia or even skin test, they are not positive in case of non-allergic. Nasal isnophilia is usually present and they are usually not raised in non-allergic one. Now, one of the important uh, condition is called rhinitis medicamentosa. This term used to describe rebound nasal congestion with overuse of tropical nasal decongestant for seven or more days. Continued use leads to fiery red congested and friable nasal mucosa due to interstitial edema. Management includes the prednisolone 40 to 60 mg per day for five to seven days, nasal steroids, oral decongestant, antihistaminics, discontinued topical nasal decongestant on seven days. Never prescribe nasal decongestant for more than 7 to 10 days. Now coming to the non-allergic uh, rhinitis. This can be the vasomotor rhinitis or NARES. Vasomotor rhinitis is called non-allergic rhinitis without isnophilia, while it is called non NARES is called non-allergic rhinitis with isnophilia. So chronic rhinocytis with nasal poly polyposis is also a different condition. And where you find the tissue edema, low tumor growth factor beta and low TG uh, restriction activity, a high tissue isnophilia and IgE increase interleukin-5 and interleukin-13. Chronic rhinocytis without nasal, nasal polyposis is usually characterized by fibrosis, less esophenic infiltration, increased interferon tumor, uh, tumor growth factor beta and T activity, pH, TH1 polarized. So there is always TH1 polarization. What are the nasal polyps? You daily see a lot of cases of allergic rhinitis having nasal polyp, and that's why nasal blockage is the problem. So they are the bilateral, pale gray, thin walled mucus sacs that arise from the middle meatus. Pathogenesis of polyp formation is unknown. Polyps may be mobile and insensitive. Turbinates usually non-mobile, tender. Persistent nasal congestion and hyposmia are the characteristic symptoms, and inverting papilloma present as a unilateral polyp. So you know better than me about the polyp because you are seeing more frequently than our uh, pulmonologist. This is the picture of uh, nasal polyps by nasal endoscopy. You can see. And now, what are the triggers which can result into the exacerbation of allergic rhinitis? This can be the grass pollen, pollen, house dust mite, pet dander, or the food allergens. Uh, the 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 kind of allergens are different for different conditions. For example, in chronic rhinitis, for allergic one, they can be pollen, mold, cat, and mite. For non-allergic, uh, uh, the trigger can be the strong odors, perfume, weather changes, or cold air. Similar kind of triggers can also be found in asthma. As I said, that around 33% of cases of allergic rhinitis, they are more susceptible to develop asthma in future. So we have to be very uh, of course, watchful during the early days of allergic rhinitis. Now, coming to the clinical picture of the allergic rhinitis. Now, if you see the in chronic uh, rhinocytis, the sinusitis, this is the major chronic inflammatory condition of the airways, affects up to 10% of the population, and characterized by smell loss, nasal obstruction, facial pain, and secretions, and frequent comorbid condition. So, if it is associated with sinusitis, 
then there can be smell loss, nasal obstruction, facial pain, secretions, and frequent comorbid condition. So, what are the uh, usual? Do uh, you, you see interrelation between the inflammatory cascade and the symptoms? In early phase reaction, there can be sneeze, rhinorrhea, or obstruction. But in late phase, you will sign nasal obstruction is the physical sign. Now, if you see the clinical features, then uh, one of these studies has shown that nasal obstruction, the rhinorrhea and sneezing and nasal itching, they are the most common symptom. And if you see the comorbid condition, then of course the bronchial asthma is the most common comorbid condition. Then sinusitis, atopic dermatitis and allergic conjunctivitis can be other comorbid conditions. Now coming to the diagnosis. Now diagnosis can be made by certain clinical parameters and by diagnostic test. So we have already discussed the symptoms of rhinorrhea, sneezing, nasal obstruction, pruritus, and then of course certain tests, for example, IgE or allergen specific IgE, the skin test usually called. If you examine the uh, case of allergic rhinosinusitis, then you will find the nose like this, an inflammatory uh, look of the rhinitis, and in the lung, it, it may be normal if it has not developed asthma or other condition. So uh, then, of course, the upper airway will show that rhinitis condition. Now, what are the signs symptoms that are suggestive of chronic rhinosinusitis? Initial evaluation should be done by medical history, major or minor symptoms, general examination, anterior rhinoscopy, nasal endoscopy, evaluation of underlying disease and comorbid conditions, and then, of course, complete blood count, serum IG, chest X-ray PA view, X-ray PNS view, or sometimes CT scan of the PNS uh, X-ray parental sinuses can be done. But it, CT should not be done in acute episode. So I used to say uh, that, yes, these are the particular investigation for the allergic rhinitis. But don't forget that one third of the patient of allergic rhinitis will develop the bronchial asthma. So always refer all allergic rhinitis patient to the pulmonologist to rule out the asthma. Or you can have the pulmonary function test also. A special indication for the alert test, for example, allergy test can be done, microbiologic evaluation can be done after the sinus puncture, challenge test for the aspirin sensitivity can be done, nasal cytology can be done to know the eosinophil and neutrophils, MRI can be done, ciliary function test can be done, biopsy can be done, blood investigation, for example, for the vaginal granulomatosis and immunodeficiencies, sodium chloride test for cystic fibrosis, electron microscopy for the ciliary function, and genetic analysis can be done. So long list is there, but they should be used judiciously, not necessarily for all the patient. So we have to remember that these tests should be done wisely. Now coming the last part of this chronic rhinosinusitis, that is the management part. So management have got four components, allergen avoidance, as avoidance is the uh, basic component of all um, disorders. Then, of course, pharmacotherapy, education of the patient, and then, of course, allergen-specific immunotherapy, which is also very good practice for the allergy in our country. Now, similarly, as we have in asthma, like a step up approach, a step down approach, every three months, you have to review the patient of allergic rhinosinusitis also. Like in asthma, we used to, uh, of course, review. And then, of course, we can step up, step down. So allergen avoidance for the all step. In step one for and for all uh, patients, step two you can add the antihistamine as per your choice. We will discuss later on. Step three short term decongestant can be added. Step four pontiolecast can be added, and the intranasal steroid can be added. So, what are the for prevention? Yes, uh, nasal saline irrigation is a very important. This is my personal experience also. That you advise the gel nati to the patient from a IU center or the IU expert. This is one of the best way to avoidance the allergy or flush out the allergens in the nasal cavity. Then, of course, topical intranasal corticosteroid, they are best anti-inflammatory. Antibiotics can be used off and on as per the indication. Oral corticosteroid can be used in certain cases, and surgery can be done. Uh, of course, you are the expert for that in certain cases. So what are the drugs available? The six type of drugs or pharmacological and non-pharmacological uh, therapies are available. H1 blocker or antihistamine, levocetazine, fexofenergine, or the blast, 
blastin are available. Corticosteroid, intranasal spray available. Leukotriene receptor monitoring cost is available. Decongestant for short term use, seven to ten days. Phenylephrine or toxin galometer metazoline are, are available. Anticholinergic epitropium is also available. And nasal saline, lost but not the least, nasal saline or gel neti or nasal douche is also important for the management of allergic rhino sinusitis. Then this picture shows the what are the various drugs and how they act on different symptoms. For example, if you give the H1 antihistaminics orally, it will work very well against the sneezing, rhinorrhea and nasal itching, but it will not work against the nasal obstruction and less work against the eye symptoms. For example, corticosteroid, they work very well for all the condition, all symptoms, sneezing, rhinorrhea, nasal obstruction, nasal itching and eye symptoms. Antileukotines, they work only for the nasal obstruction. Uh, the decongestant, uh, they work only for the nasal obstruction. It does not work for any other symptom. And anticholinergics also work for nasal obstruction. So these are the different kind of drugs and there's a different efficacy over the different symptoms. So now broadly, we have two types of remedies, non-pharmacological and pharmacological. In summary, we can say the non-pharmacological uh, uh, can be the strategy can be avoidance of allergen, wearing of mask, because mask will not only prevent the COVID-19, it will also prevent the air pollution and thus will help in prevention of allergy. Wearing of mask is important whenever you are going out of home. Nasal douching, gel neti and immunotherapy, allergen specific immunotherapy, which should be done by expertise only and with the proper indication. So pharmacological treatment can be H1 blocker, the antihistaminics, first generation or second generation, depending on your choice. Corticosteroids, usually intranasal, but sometimes you can use oral. Ligotrine receptor monitoring because uh, can be used, uh, yes, uh, even for long term. Decongestant, they should not be used on long term, only seven to ten, only for seven to ten days. And of course, anticholinergic can also be used. So this is about the pharmacological strategy and non-pharmacological strategy. Now, uh, management of uh, sinusitis, uh, chronic rhino, uh, rhino sinusitis, this can be divided as per the severity of the disease. If the case is mild, then you can use internal douche plus internal corticosteroid, or you can use long-term macrolide, macro also azithromycin. In cases of moderate uh, uh, chronic rhinosinusitis and severe chronic rhinosinusitis, you can use intranasal douching, uh, means gel neti plus intranasal corticosteroids and macrolides. Now, surgery can also be done in certain cases, and you know how to decide in which cases surgery can be done. And surgery should not be the frontline approach. After reviewing three to six monthly, if you think that medical treatment is not working properly or satisfactorily, then of course you can discuss with the patient and you can perform the surgery. Now, how you assess the outcome? Assessment of current clinical control of chronic rhinocytis. For example, in asthma, we have the four points. Here we have five points, five, six point for the evaluation, whether my patient is controlled, whether my patient is partly controlled or uncontrolled. For example, if following symptoms are, all of the following are not present, then of course it is patient is controlled. At least one is present, then partly controlled. So nasal blockage, if absent or little, facial pain absent, smell normal, sleep disturbance not present, nasal endoscopy healthy and rescue treatment not needed. This means your patient is well controlled and any of symptom is present and it is partly controlled and more than one present then of course be uncontrolled. Now certain drugs, the levo, for example, levosetragene, most widely used antihistaminic nowadays, highly selective and active H1 receptor antagonist, two times higher affinity for receptor than the cetragene, Approved for allergic rhinitis, but the only problem is that it causes sedation. Faxophenides does not penetrate the CNS, that's why it causes less sedation. 
Blastin is a new generation drugs and having highly selective for the H1 receptor and does not cause sedation. And this is the uh, the kind of uh, sedation effect you can see. Blastin has having no sedatory effect and that's why it can be used for the executive class or the or fexofenadine can also be used by causing less sedation. Topical intranasal steroid, yes, place in therapy are the first line therapy for rhinosinusitis. So it's not the last choice, but it's a first choice. And topical steroid drops should be used initially in nasal polypus, polyposis and in cases with severe obstruction. First line therapy for chronic airway inflammatory disease, the inhaled steroid is also important. Inhaled steroid has the drug of choice for asthma also and the, uh, the of course, the nasal inflammation also. What are the reasons for this choice? Enhanced clinical Im improvement. FEV1 means lung function also improved and bronchial hyporesponsiveness also improved. Decrease in inflammation, fewer activated snowfields and mast cells improvement in airway epithelium. Intranasally delivery advantage. What is the importance of intranasal spray? The importance is that this leads to uh, the avoid of uh, destruction in the gastrointestinal tract. Hepatic first pass elimination so it does not go into the liver and gut wall metabolism. Rich vasculature and high permeable structure is there inside the nose, and so very well permeability, very well absorbed. Drug improved patient compliance and comfort compared to intravenous or oral administration and lower doses. That's why we prefer the intranasal device. Antibiotics they should be used as a short term antibiotics for maximum more than more than two weeks. So maximum two weeks can be used for the acute exhibition of rhinosinusitis. Studies have shown long-term antibiotics lead to symptomatic and objective improvement similar to endoscopic sinus surgery. And if you see the efficacy of various antibiotics, then respiratory quinolones are the highly efficacious, followed by amoxiclab, cefetrioxone, high-dose amoxicillin, cefpodoxim, cefuroxim, cefdenir, trimethoprim, sulfamethoxin, doxycycline, and macrolides. So this is the situation of various antibiotics. Intranasal uh, decongestant place in therapy is that it should be used less than 10 days for, uh, of course, use taken tube dysfunction when flying in children with acute otitis media to relieve middle ear pain or pressure, post upper respiratory tract infection to reduce nasal sinus congestion to increase nasal potency before the intranasal administration of nasal steroids. Systemic glucocorticoid can also be used for the severe nasal obstruction, short-term rescue medication for uncalled symptoms or conventional pharmacotherapy and medical polypactomy. The counseling of the patient, so some kind of uh, time must be devoted for the patient for counseling. In last, not the least, the concluding remarks are that chronic rhinosinusitis is a complex condition with profound effect of Patient quality of life and healthcare expenditure, its management continues to challenge both patient and healthcare providers. There is now an evidence uh, supporting the concept that inflammation as opposed to infection is a dominant etiological factor in chronic respiratory rhinosinusitis. While systemic antibiotics and steroids have uh, were a mainstay for the treatment in the past, the focus is now shifting toward topical therapy, improved nasal dilute system, and novel anti inflammatory therapies. Immune moderators such as the anti-IgE and anti-5 antibodies are promising areas of ongoing research. Surgery continues to play an important role in the management of recalcitrant disease resulting in quality of life improvement and assisting in aggressive medical management. Now, the uh, I don't know why the organizer, they have put the tally medicine in India. So, I was not having uh, the, the, the great knowledge of this topic anyway as a speaker when I have been allotted this topic. So I search some literature. I take help of some uh, IGCP organizer uh, like uh, Tanuja. And then, of course, uh, I decided to present this also, the telemedicine in India. Now, history of telemedicine is around the uh, December 1988 when Armenia was linked to medical center in the United States for telemedicine consultation. So 1988 uh, was the time when the concept of telemedicine started. Now, if you see the history of various communications, then telegraphy and telephony was established in 1920s. Wireless and radio established in 1950s. Television came in 1960s. Color television came in India in 1982. Computer and internet came between 1990 to 2000. In India, the first computer came around 96 or, or 97. So this is the uh, some historical slide. And if you see the 
some you see very deeply historical aspect then story start with the 500 bc and currently goes up to the 2022 so what is the telemedicine telemedicine allows healthcare professional to evaluate diagnose and treat patient at a distance using the telecommunication technology so usually we are seeing the patient in your clinic in your opd but if the patient is at distance so with the help of telecommunication with the help of telecommunication technology you can visualize the patient you can assess the patient you can evaluate the patient and you can prescribe this is called telemedicine tele means distance medicine means medicine so medicine from distance is called telemedicine so telemedicine involves the use of electronic communication and software to provide clinical services to the patient without an Uh, in uh, person visit telemedicine technology is frequently used for follow up visits management of chronic conditions medical management research specialist con consultation and a host of other clinical services that can be provided remotely via secure secure video and audio connections telemedicine started in the 1950s uh, when a few hospital systems and universal medical centers started but officially started in 1988 what is telehealth so there is a difference between telemedicine and telehealth telehealth is more than telemedicine so according to the who telehealth includes the surveillance health promotion and public health functions also in addition to the medicine so this is telehealth and application of telemedicine you can see the remote consultation the remote monitoring the remote education and tele mentoring you can see the remote consultation from a psc the patient can consult to district hospital or even a tertiary care hospital this is called remote consultation and uh, of course the remote monitoring you can monitor you can ask the patient to send the ct scan and then of course you can send the patient you can ask the previous earlier ct and after the treatment you can compare and give your feedback and remote education and collaboration like i am sitting in king george medical university in the department of respiratory medicine but hundreds and hundreds of ent specialists throughout the india they are watching me they are listening me this is remote education and collaboration so tele monitoring uh, tele mentoring is also can be done that you can uh, perform the live webinar of the live surgery so that people can learn surgery from you so image advocacy for remote diagnosis is uh, very important and scalable also important the benefits of telemedicine are that it avoids unnecessary transport unnecessarily uh, so basically it's a community based care medical education and research uh, can be a very important uh, benefit of telemedicine cost saving important for uh, the patient documentation and increase range of care and education so telemed benefits are the advantage to both clinician and their patient brings medical care to the patient so that the patient does not have to travel to medical facility economical also so what are the limitations to the spread of uh, sp spread of telemedicine the poor patient doctor relationship you see for 1000 km distance patient is thinking that i am not directly the doctor have not seen me directly with touch with the passion uh, this is a you see like a uh, distant learning uh, for two and a half years in covid times children most of the children they were learning distantly but this was found that the learning was not proper patient acceptance is also there oh i want to show my doctor my lovable doctor i want to see him i want to visit him and that's why patient acceptance is also not very good the fear of technology i don't know whether they will take my data or where they use so fear of technology infrastructure you require a lot of infrastructure updated technology infrastructure so it's a costly affair also future of telemedicine many medicine centers in india are now successfully running telemedicine projects in king george medical also are running telemedicine future of telemedicine in india is definitely bright with availability of internet everywhere with new iri policies and with improving telecommunication network use of telemedicine is going to increase and available today online services urgent care health app web, web variables for example the you can monitor uh, you can uh, monitor your steps with a wrist band or so watch available soon wifi smart scale will be available blood glucose monitoring round the clock blood pressure monitoring is available right now monitoring uh, ambulatory bp monitoring ambulatory glucose monitoring a uh, bluetooth stethoscope is also now available digital thermometer is already available and advanced technology with the robotics with the robotic surgery the, uh, so many centers they are doing good 
uh, remote surgery with the help of uh, instruction from the remote centers and the robotics, the live monitoring via cell phone. So these are the some references from which we have taken this uh, matter of telemedicine. And thank you. Thank you very much for your attention for almost 40, 45 minutes. Thank you very much. Over to the organizers. Uh, thank you so much, sir, uh, for this uh, very enlightened uh, session. Uh, sir, we have few queries. Uh, if you permit, uh, can we go ahead? Sure, sure. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, first query, uh, which I can see is, uh, when do you ask for a skin prick allergy test and immunotherapy? Okay. Uh, if you go... Uh, the Indian guidelines for the indication and practice of specific immunotherapy, you can read the uh, one journal that is called Indian College of Allergy, Asthma and Applied Immunology, where we have made the guidelines for all allergy practice. Uh, first guideline came into 2009, that is in, co in uh, concurrence with the WHO position paper for the allergy practice. And second guideline came into the 2017 in which we say that usually those patients of allergic rhinitis, those patients of allergic, classically allergic uh, chronic rhinosinusitis, where the patients are having mild to moderate allergy, they are not dependent on a steroid and they are not the uh, having longer duration of history and there is no contraindication for uh, skin prick test where you can do. And such thing is important that you have to know the allergen pollen calendar also. It's not simple prick test you will do and you will find the 10 uh, plants, plant pollen allergy and you will uh, prescribe the 10 plant uh, vaccine. No, you have to know the area geographically area pollen calendar. For example, some person is allergic to some plant pollen, but that plant is not available in that geographical area. So geographical calendar of bangalore is not applicable for lucknow the lucknow calendar is not applicable for delhi so you should know what is the geographical calendar of your area usually 200 kilometer radius is, 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 the, is the is the area where the common allergens they persist and then you have to correlate with the of course patient symptom for example patient symptoms are worsening in the march but this plant does not have pollen in the march then you will not choose the allergy testing although the result is positive but you will not choose that allergen for the immunotherapy so that is called allergy testing and specific immunotherapy a specific immunotherapy means you will advise only the skin uh, uh, the the, the immuno specific immunotherapy only for the specific allergens which are prevalent in that uh, geographical area and which are prevalent in that worsening symptom month a person who is having worsening in the October and if the plant pollen is not available, pollination not occurring in that plant in the month of October or in India or that geographical area, that is not the selection. of. So proper selection, proper indication, then specific immunotherapy can be practiced. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, next question is uh, regarding allergic fungal sinus uh, sinusitis. sinusitis uh, so yes. doctor wants to understand a uh, case of allergic fungal sinusitis should be treated as acute or chronic rhinosinusitis and uh, his second is uh, like the tumor markers do we have any allergy markers available yes the question is very pertinent very good so allergic fungal sinusitis can be both acute as well as chronic during the last two and a half years especially during the covid we have seen a lot of cases of mucormycosis and probably in two and a half years the people are made aware of the term fungus infection, fungal sinusitis. So the, for example, in COVID, the, 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 the mucormycosis, the choice was the surgery. If you see, if you do the early surgery, then outcome is better. Although we have used the um, uh, liposomal uh, my, micro, uh, amphotericin B for the um, treatment of uh, this uh, mucormycosis, but the surgery is the better choice. Similarly, the chronic allergic, uh, the aspergillosis, that also manifests in terms of uh, the mycosis, nasal, my, intranasal mycosis, or the pulmonary mycosis also. 
and itraconazole is the drug of choice. The only thing is they both can be acute presentation and chronic presentation. If it is acute presentation, you have to deal with what type of fungal infection is, whether this is the uh, mucor, whether this is the aspergillus, because the, these are the two are important uh, fungal infections for the nose. And uh, then, of course, you have to select the treatment, whether you want a medical treatment or surgical treatment. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, next question is uh, from Dr. Ahmed Qureshi, MSFACS from Pune. Uh, so, sir, he wants to know uh, what is the mechanism and role of application of dilute silver nitrate solution on anterior end of inferior turbinates in allergic rhinitis? You see, a lot of things they have been tried from nasal dose to the certain other solutions. But if you see the international guidelines or Indian guidelines, they have not been recommended. The only thing is, as a part of the prevention, the nasal irrigation, nasal dose, or certain other solutions, they have been recommended and they can be used depending upon your experience. If your experience is good, you are an anti surgeon. If your experience is good, you can practice. But as I've shown in my PPT presentation, nothing has shown in the uh, international or Indian guidelines. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, the next question is, what drug to use in long term for allergic rhinosinusitis? Yes. You see, uh, if you see the practice, we are often apply ointment and we can apply ointment for months together. No problem. If we are, uh, put your nas uh, eye drop, you can uh, have the eye drop for months together, years together. Similarly, the choice should be, should be the topical treatment. For example, the intranasal corticosteroids and the nasal douche, they both are the locally acting therapies and both are working very well. If you combine them, then of course, probably it requires less and less duration of anti-allergics. So we want to have the safe treatment outcome and safe safety of the patient also. And that's why we should have a short term use of, you see, very short term use of decongestant, then short-term use of anti-allergic, anti stomach and even montolicas, but you can use long-term intranasal corticosteroid, intranasal anti stomachs and of course nasal dose. So personally, I prefer the gel neti or the gel, nasal douche, nasal saline. <clears throat> All kind of practice, depending upon the choice, can be taken as an add-on therapy and they are very much, they can uh, reduce your duration of therapy, they can reduce your doses of therapy. Uh, sir, uh, the next uh, last three questions, I mean, so first question is, uh, what should be the period for oral and intranasal steroids uh, in chronic rhinosinusitis? Yes. yes. So oral steroids are only 7 to 10 days. We should not, during the acute exacerbation, you can use one week to 10 days. They should not be used longer. Yes, in asthma, we are using the intra inhalers of steroid for years together. For example, I can give you the example. Amitabh Bachchan, for last more than 50 years, he is using inhalers. Have you seen any side effect? No. So intranasal steroids are also very safe. If you want to have the long-term uh, use of any drug, then intranasal corticosteroid should be used along with the nasal douche. Okay. Uh, <coughs> sir, the uh, second last question is, how accurate are blood tests in identification of any allergen? <laughs> yes. You see the screening test, for example, the ELISA test, they are not the specific test. Only thing is that total serum IgE and allergen specific IgE, or in cases of where you have the infection, suspicion of fungal infection, then aspergillus specific IgE or allergen specific IgG, or certain tests for the other fungal infection, they can be done. But if you see the uh, you have seen so many, I have seen uh, a full page advertisement of allergy test available at this, this, this hotel near railway station, near your airport, available for date 26, 28, 29. And huge rush is there. This is useless against the ethics. This is not permittable. Rather, this should be banned. So such type of test, they are useless. You will see they will give the result and you are hypersensitive for 100 things. How can you avoid the 100 things? 
milk is there egg is there soybean is there wheat is there banana is there yes so this is useless thing the only thing is that serum ig should be done so that you can know whether the ig is raised means patient is allergic if ig is not raised patient is not allergic and in certain other condition you can have the allergen specific ig that's all the, the the general screening tool of the simple blood test and then they will give you the test of otherwise you can do the skin test a skin prick test it's a very important test a specific test so uh, i will not recommend the commonly used uh, well advertised well propagated well propaganda is there and they test allergy test by 5 ml 3 ml of blood and you will get the result of 150 allergens no this is useless thank you sir uh sir, uh probably last two question allergic uh, is there any relationship i mean any study uh, showing any relationship between allergic rhinitis to dns allergic rhinitis to dn yes dns is a basically leading to the obstruction and that's why the non allergic or nares jisko kehte hain nares serum ig is not raised histophilia is also not raised but the patient is presenting with nasal blockage that is the case of due to debited nasal septum but as we know that around 80 per more than 80% of the indian population this is having mild dna so all dns sorry mild dns all dns are not the surgically correctable dns but the dns leading to the obstruction is always surgical intervention should be done and there is a strong relationship between nares and debited nasal septum thank you sir uh sir just one question on uh, teleconsultation so is uh, <laughs> teleconsultation valid and legal in india and what is its future yes. uh actually future is there why because if you review the uh, the health uh, recommendation of the government of india they are saying that the indian health structure is like this that you have a strong health care facility at the 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 um, metros less in second tier and third tier cities and least in the rural setup so now how you want to utilize this well developed uh, healthcare facility in the higher in the, the the metro cities and the first line and second line cities so or this is called a spoke and hub model so role of telemedicine is definitely there because so that but the the doctors and the health physicians of the psc and csc they has to be sensitized their capacity building should be done so that they can connect to the for example if somebody want a opinion from a rural area of the uttar pradesh so suppose it is 300 km from lucknow and he want opinion of dr surikant from king george medical university so the doctor and psc should be trained how to use how to utilize telemedicine then he can connect to me he can present and there should be a sudden you see limit uh, the the focus questionnaire so that doctor should know what i have to present so tally medicine is a practice of presentation of things from the periphery to the central and then opinion from the central so i think yes tally medicine is legally yes it is legally acceptable in covid we have practiced still we are practicing so legally safe and the second thing is that uh, yes where you require interaction with the patient for example psychiatry you require definitely interaction with the patient you require certain investigation for example heart patient mm -hmm. acute attack so their telemedicine does not work during the acute condition during the trauma so usually this such kind of a bullet is now bullet is there so it has to be removed there is no question of telemedicine acute mi is there so patient has to be relieved by yes mm -hmm. that video consultation can be done from a cardiologist of a tertiary care hospital but this is only a guided one so usually it should be avoided in acute condition in trauma condition surgical condition for the surgery you can't do the tele surgery only tele medicine can be done surgery cannot be done so these are the limitations of tele medicine otherwise yes i feel right now it's all over it has done wonderful uh, things uh, during the covid times and in future also its scope is there thank you sir uh, thank you so much so that was our last question and uh, i know i mean seeing the questions i mean uh, definitely uh, people were very curious all the all the ent doctors who have joined us here uh, on this uh, platform for uh, this certification program and uh, thank you so much sir for wonderfully presenting and answering each and every query in so detailed manner sir 
so thank you so much on behalf of mankind pharma i dr prashant uh once again uh, thank you uh, the speaker dr surekant sir and our audience who have joined us here in this uh, saturday evening so thank you everyone thank you so much thank you sir thank you thank you very much